text, speech, Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, thank, I think uh, the organizer, thank you, Alice, for inviting me here. I'll, uh, this is going to be something slightly different. So, feel free to ask questions. Um, there won't be any um, algebra or number field here. Uh, uh, so, but that, but that's not intentional. I mean, this is this is something that I hope. Uh, you could fix. Uh, ideally, uh, I would like to say that we have we know how to use algebraic structure in those algorithms, but we don't yet. So I'll mention this in a minute. This is possibly the, the biggest open question here. So I'll tell you about an algorithm for the shortest vector problem. Uh, I'll tell you about the fast algorithm for the shortest vector problem. It's not really fast. It's actually exponential running time, but that's the it's faster than the known algorithm. And uh, come to think of it, it's still, I had to check again this morning, but it's still the fastest, uh, the fastest uh, known, I should say, no, I gave this last time and Peter Sarnik was very annoyed. So, fastest known algorithm for the shortest vector problem. So, so this joint work with uh, Divesh Agawal, uh, uh, who's now in, uh, in Switzerland, Daniel Dadush in uh, CWI Amsterdam, and uh, Noah Stefan Davidovich, who's a student in Algebra. So I'll start with the general background and might uh, skip some of the slides. So you can ask me, I'll tell you more. So this is the lens. This is, a, you should know it by now. This is, or this is some kind of illustration of a lattice. So this is mathematically the set of all integer combinations of uh, n linearly independent vectors. Uh, those are bases. Those n vectors are bases. So History is, uh, extends beyond the, before the 19th century, even to the 18th century. So I should use all four digits here. Lagrange, Gauss, Hermit, Minkowski. And you'll see later also uh, Riemann. You'll mention Riemann in, in, the, in a few minutes. Um, so they, of course, the interests were very different. They didn't care about cryptography. They cared about number theory. And still, up to this day, many number theories care about these questions. Uh, we care more about um, applications in cryptography, and for that we need hard questions. And this is a hard question, one of the hard questions as we heard from uh, Daniele on Monday, the shortest vector problem. So you're given, you're given a lattice. What does it mean you're given a basis? You're not given all infinitely many points, of course. You're given a basis. This is the input. In this case, it's two-dimensional. You're given v1, v2. You have to find the shortest vector in this lattice, and of course, you don't want to find zero. Zero is always there. You want the shortest non-zero vector in the lattice. <coughs> and this seems like a hard problem. This is the main uh, reason we're here. It's the best known algorithm runs in time two to the order n. And uh, what I'll tell you today is a faster algorithm, uh, but it's still two to the order n. And this started uh, with the work of uh, Aitai Kumar and Shiva Kumar, I mentioned later. Uh, and currently, there's no better quantum algorithm uh, known as far as uh, I know. Um, so uh, there's nothing uh, better known quantumly. Uh, this, the, the fastest known algorithm is, is this classic algorithm I'll show you. Uh, and I'll get more, get more of this later. So here is the, the basis, the input basis, and what we need to find the shortest vector. This is the lattice they, they generate. This happens to be the shortest vector, as far as I can tell. Um, the base is not unique. There are several, many possible bases. That's what makes the question hard. Right? If, if I give you this, you can immediately tell me that V2 finds the shortest. But generally, the basis can be very bad, and you don't know what, what the shortest vector is. is. This is, this is why the question is hard. Oh, this is also why the question is so interesting for cryptography, because there are many possible representations of this object. And let me mention just how pathetic the situation is, even very special cases. Uh, I like mentioning this special case because it, it really looks like it has to be easy. So if you, you take the simplest of all, the Zn, the simplest lattice of all, and just rotate, this is the two dimensions. There aren't so many rotations. Definitely, uh, you just have to choose an angle, there's only one parameter. But in n dimensions, there are more parameters, uh, order n squared parameters. Uh, but even in such a case where your input is guaranteed to be a rotation of Zn, even then you, you don't know how to find the shortest vector. It seems, it seems surprising if you haven't seen it before. 
uh, and uh, recently there was a very nice algorithm uh, of uh, Alice and Hendrik showing a special case of this, so sp certain kinds of rotations, uh, how to solve, how to find it, like how to, how, how to uh, recover the rotation. But this is, again, a special case of this, not, not any rotation, but only very specific rotations. This is my interpretation. Uh, this is my way of describing the results. It's equivalent to the way of describing the results. Okay, so this is a very nice question that you want to you can try to think about. Uh, and I think this is more generally the question is, you know, if you assume things about the lattice, can you solve things faster? Uh, and if you assume the lattice uh, comes from ideals in number field, how do you make use of it? This is a very interesting question, and uh, maybe maybe there's a way to combine some of the ideas I showed today with some structure. In the back. I don't know how to do that. So far, those uh, symmetries uh, haven't been used in algorithms of the kind I showed today, basically, to speed up this exponential time. This would be fantastic. Questions? Background? So, because I'm talking about algorithms, I have to just mention you know, the algorithm, uh, what, uh, what the algorithm does, it does not solve the shortest vector. That is very hard to pass. The LNL algorithm is an efficient algorithm. It runs in polynomial time. It is a very fast algorithm. Uh, but it outputs some somewhat short vectors. So specifically, it outputs a vector whose length is at most 2 to the n times the shortest. 2 to the n sounds bad, but in many cases, this is all this is. Uh, very useful uh, and, and has lots of applications. Uh, so this is, this is sort of the, the most important result uh, in, in this area, LNL algorithm and the following, the algorithm that falls from it. Um, what, I'm, what I care about today is, is the question of finding short, really short vectors. So this, is, this, this algorithm finds vectors that are not so short, especially not in high dimensions where cryptography comes in. Um, so approximation factor is some exponential in N. Uh, we care about finding exactly short vectors, uh, but even if we find somewhat short vectors in the sense of, uh, say, uh, polynomial in dimension, polynomial in n times lambda one, that would be a huge breakthrough. I'll show you today how to find the exact shortest, but uh, I'm equally happy with say n times the shortest. That, that would be very nice for cryptography. That's all you really need. Uh, finding you need to find vectors that are n times the shortest, or something of that order. Okay. So um, cryptography started, the applications, the positive applications of cryptography started in the mid-90s with uh, Aitai. He realized, this is what uh, we heard about uh, several times this week, he realized you can actually create cryptographic schemes uh, based on uh, based on axes. This is, uh, Daniela mentioned some of this earlier this morning. Uh, so any more questions about the background before we get to the technical part? So I'll be I'll go in a very uh, relaxed pace. I don't have so much to say, and I'll try not to go into too much, into too many technicalities. Um, uh, but let's skip that. Okay. So, um, so this is a table. I hate tables, but I think here maybe it's good to once see the, the history of this result. So here are the progress on the provable algorithms for the shortest vector. So. Kanan, uh, Kanan in 86 uh, presented an algorithm running in time n to the n to the order n. Um, and this has been the, the best uh, algorithm for many years until Aitai Kumar and Shiva Kumar uh, showed in 2001 how to, how to solve this in time 2 to the n. 2 to the order n, I should say. Okay. And, and this again, this stood for many years. And there were some improvements. Uh, I mentioned a few. There is um, Guyen VT. Uh, there are improvements by Michanki and Darius, but uh, what they managed to do is they use roughly uh, the same, uh, similar ideas, of course more sophisticated, and they managed to get the exponent a bit down, 2 to the 2.465 n. Uh, and there was a nice, very nice breakthrough uh, about five years ago by Michancho and Vulgaris, um, uh, and they managed to get the exponent further down to 2. That by itself is not so impressive. Uh, what was very very nice about the algorithm is that it was uh, deterministic. It's the first time that a deterministic algorithm running in time to the end was suggested. And then beyond that, if you don't care about randomized versions deterministic, it, it really uses it really use new ideas. Okay. 
So you know, not, the, the thing about this result is not so much the improvement in exponent, which is nice, but it's really the fact that it was based on totally new ideas, based on the Bohr and Neusel, a very nice uh, algorithm. And, and what we do today uh, is bring the exponent further down uh, to 2 to the n. So the running time is 2 to the n. Um, um, so you might say, again, you know, just improvement in constant. We're uh, mathematicians. We don't care about that. Uh, very well, it might be true. Uh, uh, I think this algorithm, I tried to convince you, it's very natural. Uh, so it's a, I think it's a very nice algorithm, and, and I hope I'll convince you of that. And um, it, it also introduces some you know, new ideas that I hope will be useful later. Uh, we have some ideas on how to improve this to 2 to the n over 2, so 2 to the half n. Uh, maybe we'll get to see some of those. I'll briefly indicate how this can be done. But this is currently the state of the art, 2 to the n running time. So you know, there's improvement in the exponent, but more than that, I think there's some, there are some nice ideas that I try to show you here. No, not at all, actually. It's, it's, it's very, very randomized. Uh, so in, in, in spirit, it would be closer to this, actually, to the algorithm of Aita Kumar Shiva Kumar. <coughs> One thing I should say, and this is the um, reason that in practice, uh, people still would still use Kanan-like algorithms today. That all, all those algorithms, except Kanan's algorithm, use exponential space. So don't, don't worry about this too much. That Kanan's algorithm is the only one using polynomial space. So it's easier to implement in practice. Those are quite hard to implement. I should say there's been lots of nice work in, in the recent few years on, on making those algorithms um, more practical through use of heuristics. So Thais might mean, uh, he was around here, might, might tell you, oh, might tell you more about this. So if you want, you can taste. He, uh, there's lots of nice work on heuristics. It's not bad heuristic in the sense that it's very clearly defined heuristics, and they managed to get the running time a lot down. So I, don't, I forget what the best is, but it's, it's much below two to the n, what is 0.3n. Okay. So, so it's heuristic, but it's in some good sense. I, I don't think maybe you, you can't really find the shortest vector in the worst case, but on reasonable instances, it should find something as good as almost as good as short. But I'll, tell, I'll talk today only about provable things. And this is currently the state of the art. More questions? <coughs> okay. So I'll go, I'll try to go a bit uh, slowly and tell you how, how we actually um, solve this. How you, in time 2 to the end, find the shortest vector in any given. And this is the protagonist. Uh, it's what we call the discrete Gaussian distribution. Um, and this is, it's featuring a lot in, uh, in lattice-based cryptography. Uh, we've, heard, we've heard that mentioned before. In this application, I think it's uh, maybe fair to say it's the first time it's really used for al algorithmic purposes. And here we need, uh, for the experts, I should say, in cryptography, this has been usually used above what we call the smoothing parameter. It's been used in the case where, where, the, where the, the distribution is so wide that it looks like it's continuous. Here we actually care uh, about smaller parameters, we really have to worry about the discreteness of the distribution. But this is just for the experts. Okay, so, so this is the distribution we care about. What is this distribution? Well, you look, you can see the, the, the formula. It should look familiar. It's e to the minus norm squared. We've seen it before. This is how you define the Gaussian distribution. e to the minus this is the L2 norm, e to the minus L2 norm squared. Uh, the only difference is this is discrete. This is defined. Support is only on lattice points. So you take some lattice L, uh, and you define distribution on L, and the mass that each point gets is proportional. This is this alpha-like thing there. The mass each point gets is proportional to e to the minus the norm squared. Of course, you have to normalize. I didn't write. I did not bother writing the normalization factor. I should really be dividing here by the sum of all these numbers over the lattice to make sure that the sum to one is probability is okay. I'm sorry, no ideals, uh, no modules, no orders. So just uh, the e is the so uh, okay. S here is the uh, uh, standard deviation basically. So the bigger S is, the wider the thing. You see I'm dividing by S squared there. 
So S is the standard deviation of the Gaussian. Um, so this is what it would look like. Um, say this is the lattice, uh, maybe Z squared. And, and this is with the parameter S is 10. So it looks like a Gaussian, a certain uh, width, like width 10 or so. Now if I change the parameter, say I take the parameter S equals four, my guess becomes narrow. Make sense? So I'm pro plotting here the, the, the probability mass uh, function. So what's the connection? Well, um, see what happens when I take S to be small enough, maybe four, you start seeing that, well, this guy, this is the, the highest mass is given to the origin, to zero, to point zero. But you see that the shortest vectors, those, uh, one of those four points, or two of those four points here, they get the highest mass. And this is to be expected, right? Because in the exponent, we have minus of the norm squared. So the smaller the norm, the higher the mass. And of course, the close, the, the shorter the point, the more mass you get. Okay, you can see this, the peak is here. So why am I saying this? It turns out, as you might expect, that if you, if you, can, if you can sample from this distribution, you will find short vectors. Right? You'll find perhaps even the shortest vector. So that's, that's what we'll try to do here. This is the, 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 the first main message of this, uh, of this work, that um, forget about the shortest vector problem. This is the wrong thing uh, to think about. What you really want to think about is the discrete Gaussian distribution. And what you want to do is sample it for a small enough parameter. Yes. So that's, that's what we'll do from now on. We forget about the shortest vector problem and just I'll show you how to sample from this distribution. This is a harder problem than solving the shortest vector problem. Because if you sample from this, as I'll show in more detail in a minute, you, you also find the shortest vector. Make sense? Uh, maybe just to check <coughs> that, uh, that to, to some sanity check, let me just mention. You know, so what happens if S is too small? If I take S to be, I don't have a picture for this, but can try to imagine if I took S too small, S make S 0 0.01, what would it look like? Zero. Pretty much uh, uh, distribution, deterministic distribution of all those masses of zero. Uh, and that's also not good because I told you I don't want to find zero vectors. I know that zero is always in the lattice. This doesn't solve the shortest vector problem. So there is some kind of a uh, sweet spot. There's the right S, so small but not too small. And you can compute what that right S is, and we won't worry about it too much. But this is what I'll, I'll show you next. So this is, so, so this is uh, the message I wanted to remember from now. And let me uh, switch to the board. Did someone turn the light back on, so we have. It's, uh, oh, thank you. Okay. Okay. So let me just summarize uh, the thing I said now. Let's write it down uh, formally. This is not very difficult to prove. Um, this reduction from SVP to uh, discrete Gaussian sampling, you can prove that for any um, lattice L in Rn, there exists some S. I can write down what S is exactly if you want to know. It's some, some function of, of the shortest vector of lambda 1, such that the probability that if you sample x from the discrete Gaussian distribution DLS, x is shortest um, non-zero in L, the probability of that is not too small. So, so, namely, it's going to be at least 1.38 to the minus n, uh, which luckily for us is bigger than 2 to the minus n over 2. We'll see later why I care about Slightly bigger. Okay, so let me just tell you how you prove this. What the proof idea? I won't spend too much time on this. So what what is the danger? What is the fear? The fear is this. Here is the origin, and here maybe this is the shortest vector. This is what I'm trying to find: the shortest vector. The fear is that maybe. There are vectors that are, so maybe let's draw a circle here. The fear is, I mean, there are vectors that are only a tiny bit longer, maybe slightly outside, I don't know if you can see that, but the vectors are slightly longer than the shortest vector. Um, 
and they kind of they steal they steal all the mass. So if I sample, I actually get those and not this. So maybe there's another one here, another one. Maybe there are tons of them. And whenever I sample, what I get are one of those fake guys. And I won't actually get to see this uh, shortest guy. So this is kind of my, this is my fear. And the, remember that the mass is a function of your norm. So if those are roughly the same norm as this guy, they'll get roughly the same mass. So we're competing for the same probability. If I sample from such a lattice, I'll have trouble because I always land on one of those fake guys and I never find the true uh, shortest vector. So you see the, the potential trouble here. Sampling, maybe I'll never find this because there's so many other guys um, and they're only a tiny bit longer. Um, so, can anyone guess what saves us here? So, what, yeah, what saves us here is that we're not dealing with an arbitrary set of points. This is the lattice. So, you cannot really have infinitely many points lying like that. If this is the shortest vector in the lattice, we call this distance, maybe this is one. Then, because this is the set of points is a lattice, then the distance between any two points must be at least one. Okay, not only uh, between this and the origin, but in fact, any two points must have separation of at least at least one. So this cannot really happen. It actually must be good gaps between those points on the on this shell. And then what you end up asking yourself is. You know, if I know that I have those points on the shell and the distance between any two is at least one, how many can I have? And this is something that's called the kissing number, uh, and there are uh, good bounds on this, uh, the strongest of which is by Kabatyansky and Levishten, and this, this is what brings this strange 1.38 number here. And this is the strongest known bound of this kissing number. The bounding, the number of possible points that can sit on the shell um, uh, of radius one, uh, such that the pairwise distance between two points is at least one. So this is uh, basically applying now uh, Kabatkansky and Levish, and it's slightly more sophisticated because they don't all have to sit here. Maybe there are some points slightly away from the shell. You have to worry about this too. But, but this is the intuition. Okay. So let's just summarize so far. Summary so far is that we actually don't have to worry about the shortest vector problem. Only about sampling from a discrete Gaussian distribution. And this is what we'll, this is what the main theorem does. Okay, so this is what we have to worry about from now on. There exists, this is what we try to prove. There exists an algorithm that outputs two to the n over two samples. So it even outputs lots of samples. Uh, you see why I like why why we need that. Samples from DLS for any given LS, for any given LS in time, roughly two to the n. N is always the dimension. N is dimension. And based on what we saw here, uh, based on proposition one, based on proposition one, this implies algorithm for SVP. So two to the n time algorithm for SVP. So let me just say why you you run this algorithm with the proper choice of S in time two to the n, you get you get this nice number of samples. You get two to the n over two samples from the distribution for the for the proper choice of n. And now you go back here and say, well, the probability that uh, one sample is the shortest is quite high. It's bigger than two to the minus n over two. Now I have two to the n over two samples, so with good probability, at least one of them, in fact, many of them, will be the shortest non-zero vector. And I can identify that. I just look for the shortest vector right? after eliminating all the zero ones. Make sense? Uh, so I think for practice, so it's probably it's probably it's far from being tight, and I think uh, because we don't believe that this can be, can be that tight, this is a, 
for instance, the kissing number, the best lower bound kissing number for that is at n to the log n, which is way off this 1.38. You know. It is not actually the 1.38, but it's, it's, it's way below the bound we use here. Uh, even though that's actually a slightly different question there. There's a kissing number question. So maybe tight, maybe you have more intuition. This, I think, is far from tight. And what probably you would uh, you sometimes do in this situation is to analyze what happens for random lattice for, for Yeah, so th this, this is, a, the, the base of the exponent here is not exactly the kissing number. It has to do with the, the probabilities you see in the Gaussian. It's a bit misleading. There's some calculation you have to do before you get to 1.3. I forget what the, yeah, the kissing number gives you, yeah, the 2, point, 2 to the point 0.41, right, the beta in the Kopitansky level. Okay. So, do to the, so, so yeah, so one, yeah, so, okay, some number. But w what you would then do, I mean, this, this kabatansky lavish is, is the best upper bound we know. And I think many people would believe that a random set of points gives you the, the best pack. Really. And then we'd use this. If you assume this, you get much stronger bounds. I forget what the number is. I didn't even try it once, but you get a much better number here. Let me just point out that if you care about Provable, you know, provable algorithm, this is not the bottom. You can improve this tremendously. It wouldn't help me because this is my bottom. I should say that even if I only want to have one sample, I don't know how to do it in less time to give me Okay, so this is really the bottom for us, but you're right, this is an interesting question. Um, if you're doing uh, heuristic algorithms, there are ways, there are good heuristics on why this should be. Uh, this should not be tight. But Something funny about this algorithm that you need two to the end just to get it started, and you know, once you're there, you get two to the end over two samples for free. But uh, even just getting one, I don't know how to do less than that. I mentioned before, you know, I'm happy with just one short vector. It doesn't have to be the shortest. I'll be happy with one short vector. This is, I don't know how to get uh, below two to the end. But it's, Good. So there's a technical issue here I glossed over um, that you actually don't know S because if S, well, I, I know mathematically I know S, but algorithmically I might not know S. It's some function that looks like this squared 2 pi e over beta squared n times lambda 1. Beta is some, so beta is some discrete constant 2 to the point 0.41. The trouble is that I don't, I don't really know uh, lambda one exactly, but it's only issue. You don't have to know it very exactly. What you end up doing is trying several values until you find the lambda. It's not, um, it's not very slow. It doesn't slow down things. So uh, it, it's not an issue. So if you don't want to worry about it, don't worry about it. Um, okay. Other questions? Okay, so for now, I just want to show you how to do this. And it's, it's actually a nice, nice idea that uh, I can I can try to uh, demonstrate. He would do live uh, uh, implementation of the algorithm on the board, uh, but let, let me just tell you how you start, how you start this course, so let, let, what the overall structure is. So the hope is again to, to sample from this distribution in time two to the n. Um, what I what I show you how to do is uh, is this. The way we'll do it is we'll first sample from this distribution for large s, large, somewhat large s. And this, just take my word for it, this is easy. And, and, and the reason this is easy is because when s is large, this distribution consists of long vectors. And long vectors is something that we can find efficiently okay, using things like LLL. So we have, we have a good understanding of long vectors in the lattice. This is something we can do efficiently using LLL. Um, uh, and hence we can sample from DLS, the, the question, the trouble of sampling from DLS is only when S is small, that's what I'm saying. When S is big, there's no issue. We know how to do it. Specifically, we use the algorithm um, of Craig, uh, Chris, and uh, Vinod Viking, and the GPV, show us uh, how to sample from this when S is big enough. And this, is, this is how we bootstrap the process. And the main step, this is what I'll show you, this is what we'll focus on, is this. Um, we'll show this. 
um, suffices to show how to take uh, samples samples from D and S and transform them not implication information transform them into samples from something smaller, DLS over two, or over some favorite constant even the one. So this is all we'll do from now on. We'll take a bunch of samples from DLS. This is just a list, just a list of vectors from from the status L, less proportional to the S, and I'll show you how to massage those vectors and get samples for from a shorter, from a narrower Gaussian, shrink the vector by a factor of two. Okay. This is the main thing. Once you see how, once you do this, you're done. You can, you can repeat it over and over again. You take those samples, you divide by a factor of two, you get new samples, uh, shorter by a factor of two, and then you do it over again. Take the samples, bring them by a factor of two. Make sense? So all you need to know, all you need to see from now, all I have to show you, is how to shrink things by factor. So maybe I'll say a few more at the end and how to combine everything together. But, but that's that's the main uh, the main trouble for now. Okay. So uh, let's let's take a live uh, do live demonstration and see how, how this works. So I'll, because I have uh, I don't want to write long vectors for the demonstration purposes only. So for the examples, let's assume that n is 1. But again, this is only for the examples. n equals 1. Okay, I mentioned the following fact that in this case, also 2 to the n is 2. Just in case you're seeing. So 1 is 1 and 2 to the n is 2. But only for the examples. So you have to keep in the back of your mind that actually n is 100 or 1,000. So we're hoping to solve it for any n. Okay, so here are the first um, input meter. So we get input from DLS, and actually, let's also for the examples take L. Before this one dimensional, I'll just take it to be Z, which is favorite, my favorite uh, my favorite one dimensional. It's okay. So here, here is a list of samples from DLS. Uh -huh, maybe S is true. Stuff. So here is a list of samples. From um, B, uh, in this case has Z, so B, Z, S, and uh, maybe S is there, one, two, or three. Okay, so this is not very precise. Um, two minus two, minus two, two minus two. Does it look Gaussian to me? Six is an outlier here. Say it. Everybody, where? Yeah, there's a constant. There's a big constant there. Bear with me. Yeah, you're right. So minus one. I'm trying to demonstrate the idea here. Good. So imagine those are the input samples, and yeah, so uh, just, uh, yeah, there should be more zeros, but it won't make it won't make for an interesting example. So I decided to add some. Spice it up with some six and just minus three because they won't show it in practice. So these are samples from the following distribution just to make sure we understand um, why there should be more zeros. So this is the distribution that I'm sampling from. Maybe it's not deviation, not quite one. Bear with me. Okay. Okay, so the discrete distribution, I'm just giving you the rough shape of it. Okay, the discrete distribution over the integers. What I want to do is shrink it, maybe by a factor of two. So here is the first naive, naive idea. It's so naive that you need to see what goes wrong. I get my samples. I want to shrink them. and shrink them. One good operation. Maybe I divide them. I divide by two. If I take those samples, I divide them by two. This is naive. Extremely naive. Just divide by two. So I get the following. It starts good. Uh, one minus one, three, three, good, 
And I know maybe the problem. Minus three halves. Zero minus half minus half one. Okay, so this is the good thing about dividing by two is that indeed you shrink the standard deviation, you shrink the radius to make it short, right? The distribution here turned into a narrow distribution. The parameter now one half. Um, the trouble is that I also change the domain. Now I get half integer points. Of course, if I divide by two, the odd points are going to no longer be integer, um, and this is not the right distribution. Recall we are talking about distributions on support L. Everything has to be the same left. In this case, everything has to be integer. So we're trying to sample from the start. So this is, is this seems like a bad idea. Um, so what would be the second? That's the third uh, naive idea. Okay, so we should not so naive. So let's let's that's what we'll do at the end. But let's let's be naive too. If it's so naive, it's hard to imagine. Um, naive two would say keep only the even points. The point I'm trying to make here is trying to point this out. Keep even only. Keep only even and divide by two. And there's something important to understand here. So now I, I, I take my points, I throw away all the other points. I throw away minus three, minus one, minus one. And I only keep the even ones and divide by two. This is good in the sense that this output, the correct distribution, the output distribution is easy to prove. The output distribution would be discrete Gaussian over integers of the appropriate standard deviation. We divide them, we divide the even numbers by two, and that's perfectly fine. Because those even numbers, if I only if I condition being even, my distribution is the street Gaussian over even number, or twos. And if I divide them by two, I get I get I get integer number of the appropriate appropriate sign. This is good. But what is not good? What is not so good here? I'm wasting two names. So a factor of two is not so bad, but this is this two is actually two to the n. Remember, two to the n equals two. And in higher n, what I'll be doing here, I'll be keeping only those vectors, all of whose coordinates are even. This is here; it's one-dimensional. Half the points are even, or slightly more than half. Uh, and in general, it's going to be potentially two to the minus n that I'll be keeping. Only fraction two to the minus. N. This is pretty bad. Because if I want to keep in 2 to the minus n, so you know, maybe I'm starting with 2 to the minus n, I'll be left with only 1. But recall I have to do this a few times. This process is not just once. I'll do it a small number of times, but still maybe a, you know, a square root n times. n times I have to repeat this. Each time I'm losing 2 to the n factor, I'll be left with nothing. Right? If I want to keep running times 2 to the n, I'm in a very bad uh, shape. So. So this, this loses too much. This, this has a huge loss, loss factor, uh, and we need something smart. Let's try then, is that usually works. Let's see if it works. Yeah. This is what we'll actually be doing. I'll try to demonstrate it there. The idea is this, and this is the following uh, deep observation that if you take two even numbers and you take their average, you get an integer. Okay. You take two odd numbers and average them, you again get an integer. It's easy to verify. Uh, so the average of two numbers of the same parity is an integer. So as, as Daniel suggested, maybe what we should be doing is this. Let's take our numbers and split them into even and odd. So there'll be the even numbers. 2 minus 2, 6, 0, 0, 2. By the way, the fact that they're more even than odd is not a coincidence. You can show this. Always true that even gets higher probability than odd. Uh, you might, you know, see, you might you know, uh, see kind of why it might happen. It's actually a nice proof. You don't take the slide if you, if you don't know this. Uh, even the probability of even is always at least large as the probability of odd. So here those are, I get six, six points, and here I get minus three, minus one, minus one. 
and those are the other ones. And now what I'll do, I'll pair them up. So let's take the first pair. I don't know if you can see this, two and minus two. We'll take the second pair, six and zero, and the third pair is zero, two. And then what I'll output is the answer. So here, two minus two gives me zero. Six and zero gives me three. Zero and two gives me one. Minus three, minus two, minus two. And there's the one that's over. So I'm still losing, but this two is not two to the end, it's really two. So that's not so bad. So I mean there is a there's a two at the end. Here that's true. I'm bunching them in pairs and I'm losing a factor of two because from any, any two I, I have you know I'll output one, but that's not so bad. Because I'm not going to repeat this so many times. So, so okay, so now you're going. I was hoping not to say it, but yeah, I don't think really it start with the LL because we anyway running in time through to the end. I can do something slightly more sophisticated. So I won't have to do it so many times. It's like polylog N or even you know, something that small. That's not really so that the factor of two is not really an issue. And actually you don't have to do this factor of two if you want to. Um, turns out you can take not only the average divided by two, but also the difference divided by two. And it's an independent sample, maybe we get to it later. But yeah. Let's lose this factor of two, it's not really an issue. Okay, so okay, so where are we? So this is roughly this is the way the algorithm works again. We get this list of samples, we would split even and odd. Uh, we would take samples, average them, um, uh, average uh, samples of the uh, pairs of the same parity. Okay, so we would average two even numbers, two even numbers, two even numbers, two odd numbers. Questions? Yes. Yeah. Good, good, okay. Uh, so, uh, so you're saying, okay, so wh what did we achieve here? Well, I showed you a method uh, that uh, ostensibly outputs integer numbers, at least this is good. But what about the distribution? Um, you know, previously there was, it made some sense because we took a number divided by two, so we shrink you know, the standard deviation, but now Initially, you might think this is very stupid because we're adding two numbers and then dividing by two. So maybe we didn't gain it. Maybe we're still dealing with some numbers of the same standard deviation. What saves us here is the following amazing property of normal variables. If you add two independent normal variables, say, of standard deviation one, the result is a, is a normal variable of standard deviation square root two, not two. Okay, so if you remember, variances of normal variables, they add. They, sum, they, they, they add up, but standard deviation does not. So if I have, um, uh, if, if you know, x and y are independent, uh, normal 0, 1, x plus y is normal 0, 2. There's two denoting variance. Hence, x plus y over 2 is uh, normal 0, 1 half. Okay, so by averaging two independent normals, I actually shrink the radius not by a factor of two anymore, only by a factor of square root two, but that's equally good. Okay, so I don't really need the two here. Any constant factor is, is equally good. So the hope is that this process takes those samples, outputs a list of sample, that's maybe slightly shorter, shorter by a factor of two, but factor two is not so bad. Uh, and those numbers that we output, those in general, those lattice points are going to be sample, going to be distributed according to a discrete Gaussian distribution of standard deviations smaller by a factor of square root. That's the hope. Okay? Uh, but why? Why would that be true? Uh, may, uh, before we get here, let me just mention one more thing, just to make sure it's clear, because this is the one-dimensional case. In the n-dimensional case, we call there's more than even and odd. There's actually two to the n even odd uh, options based on all the n coordinates. So what you would have to do here, uh, there was there were two buckets. There was even bucket and the old bucket. There you would have two to the n buckets based on the parities of the coordinates. And exactly the same thing. You would pair, you take pairs from the bucket and add them up together. So and average them and output the average. So it would be exactly the same thing just with two to the n buckets. Just to, just to show you what it would look like in the n dimensional case. 
Pai do Lucas. Não, pai. Yes. 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 Let's think of it as being exact. There's enough to worry about. Forget about this. You're right. There's you know, in practice you don't really sample exactly. You know, you can't really toss a. Uh, you can't really choose a uniform element. You know, from zero, one, two, because you can't really toss the coin with. Uh, one third, two third probability, but let's not worry about this. You can you can get extremely close to this distribution. So let's let's not worry about this. This is not uh, the, 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 the serious the serious things to worry about it before we get there. So what is the serious thing that I'm, I'm uh, alluding to? <coughs> the serious thing that I didn't tell you about is that there's, there's a very nice process and you know, it's natural, right? It's, it's a natural thing to do. But why on earth would this give you the right distribution at all? But even if you start with exactly the right distribution, which is what we do, we start exactly from DLS, why would this process ever give you, because now it will be square root 2, but why would it ever give you DLS over square root 2? And, and when I first saw this, I thought, indeed, there's, there's just no chance this would ever work. This, the output of this will not be the right distribution. Just because you know, you're trying to do the math, and it doesn't, doesn't seem to work, and you, there's no reason why it would work. Um, and then uh, my student uh, insisted that someone came up with the proof that it does work almost. So let me show you what I mean. And this is this. Okay. So what are we seeing here? So this is the input distribution. This is what I was drawing there. Just maybe the, the parameter is slightly different. Thanks. And here's what happens after you run this process. Okay. So these are this is the input distribution that maybe um, 40%, zero, and so on. Um, here's what happens after you apply the process. So try to interpret this. So if you take the even bucket, you take only what falls in the even bucket and the, the output of the average of two things, this is what you get, this distribution given by the red points. And you see it's, it's, it's narrower than what we had before. So more concentrated around zero, kind of looks like uh, it's, it's going in the right direction. Um, but it is not the distribution we, we need, because if you plot the orange, it's what we want. The orange would be the discrete Gaussian distribution of the appropriate parameter. The orange is not quite the red. You see it has more mass on minus one and one, less mass on, on zero. So okay, let's, let's go back, let's go to the odd bucket. Let's go to the bucket of the odd numbers and see what it looks like, what, what average of pairs of odd samples um, um, look like. And this distribution they create, it's also not the right distribution. You see, it gives too little mass to zero and too much mass to one minus one and so on. Okay, here it's hard to tell, but also it's not quite the same thing. So this looks like it's just not good. It's not, neither of them gives the right distribution. Neither the um, even or the odd gives you what you want. Uh, uh, but what, uh, what you might hope at this point is that, well, if you perhaps, you know, so ideally I would like to say yeah, the even gives you the right distribution, the odd gives you the right distribution, and so output, which is a mixture of the two things, is also the right distribution. This is not, obviously not the case. The even is wrong, the odd is wrong. You might still hope that for some mysterious reason, the mixture of the two is the right distribution. Uh, I didn't plot this here, but turns out that the mixture of the two, at least the naive mixture of the two, is also not the right distribution. However, if you mix them properly, then you do get the right distribution. And this was total magic. Uh, and, uh, let me just say that after we proved it, we went to some uh, old books and realized that we're not the first to discover this magic relation. It's actually something that. Uh, Riemann already did. So Riemann already discovered something called Riemann's theta relations, and it's based on essentially the same idea. So Riemann and Jacobi were very uh, happy about this uh, connection I mentioned. Uh, it's a simple thing to prove, but it's kind of unexpected uh, if you haven't seen it before. Yep. 
So let's keep the board. Let's say a few more things here, and then I can show what what the proof says. Okay, so. So recall, we have those numbers that came from the even bucket, and we have those numbers here that came from the odd bucket. And notice that here we had, uh, it seems like two thirds of the numbers are even, one third of the numbers are odd. So if we just took all those numbers and just output them, we would get naturally two third proportion coming from the even bucket and one third coming from the odd bucket. So in this example here, um, we have roughly p even is two thirds, and p odd would be one third. It turns out that if you just output those numbers as they come out of the process, this would not work. You should not use probability two thirds for the output of the even bucket and probability one third for the output of the odd bucket. What you should be doing is actually using the squares. You should use p squared even square of the probability and square of the odd probability. In this case, this would give you 4 over 9 for even and 1 over 9 for odd, or if you normalize, it would tell you 80% even, 20% odd. And this is what you should be doing here. Turns out that if you take 80% of your output from the even bucket and only 20% of the output coming from the odd bucket, the output would be exactly the desired uh, distribution. So I'll uh, show you, try to show you a picture, give some intuition why is this case, and then wrap, wrap things up. Um, so again, to ask if you're uh, surprised, that once, you, you know, once you believe this might be true, it's not difficult to prove or, or to see how to prove it. So here, so here's how uh, Beeman, uh, or one way to see it, I'm not sure if this is the way to prove it, but this is one way to visualize what's going on and why it's, uh, why, does it, why does it actually work. So here's what we're actually doing here. So um, if you consider the pairs uh, of points that are even, comma, comma even, this is 0, 0, this is 2, comma 0, this is 0, comma 2, those are the points that are both, both of the coordinates are even. Okay? So if you think about those are the pairs that you find in the even bucket. When you pair up the numbers, you get a pair of points that are both even, and the distribution, if you put a Gaussian distribution on top of this, the distribution you have on the even numbers is exactly what you see there. Pairs of even numbers. And this will give you Gaussian distribution on the even numbers. And similarly, for the odd numbers, you get, you get some distribution on those pairs of odd numbers. Um, what we're doing here by mixing the even and the odd probability square of what they are in the input distribution, we're basically creating the Gaussian distribution on this on this two-dimensional um, Again, I'm talking here about the one-dimensional example of Gaussian samples from Z. And what I'm drawing here is the distribution of pairs that we consider. Okay, with probability 80% is coming from the even bucket, probability 20% coming from the odd. Let me again try to explain where the square comes from. If you consider this, this lattice here, and you consider the mass that the even even points get, the mass the even even points get is proportional to the square of the mass of the even points. That's because the set of even even points is a contingent product of even in the x-axis and even in the y. So the total mass is square of the total mass on the you know, x-axis alone. This is because the Gaussian distribution is a total distribution. And similarly for the odd points, the mass of the, uh, the mass, the odd comma odd points get is the square, proportionally the square of the uh, uh, odd, uh, of the odd points in the original. So what's the, so what's the connection? Where, is, where does the averaging come in? What I told you so far, so this is, uh, you know, this might be hard to follow, but let, um, let me show anyway the picture. Maybe you just uh, get some intuition from it. What I told you so far is that if I consider the distribution of a pair of points that with probability 80% come from the even, probability 20% come from odd, or generally 
function probability p even squared from even with p o squared from odd. That distribution looks exactly, is distributed exactly like the Gaussian distribution on this line. And here's the magic. What we're outputting is not the pair, we're outputting the average of those two numbers. So basically, we're outputting the projection on this line is 45 degrees line. And here's the grand animation. So carefully, look carefully. And this is what you get. After rotating by 45 degrees, this is the magic, you obtain, as you can see, something with a Cartesian product structure. So this axis, and this axis, the status that you get here, where it simply it looks again like z squared. It's a, it's a direct product of this and this, Cartesian product of these two sets, um, which means that the Gaussian, this Gaussian mass, is actually a product distribution, namely, the distribution of the x of, of this coordinate is independent of the distribution of this coordinate. This is a property of the Gaussian distribution whenever you have a product set. So what I just told you now is that if you take a pair and use the mixing weight as I just suggested, then the distribution of x plus y, comma x minus y, though this is an independent pair of numbers, um, and they individually each distributed for the Gaussian distribution. So x plus y will be this, x minus y will be this. We actually, we ignore x minus y in the description before, we only use x plus y. This is, the important thing is x plus y. This was perhaps a bit um, difficult to follow, but this is, this is the basic uh, idea. So in the uh, remaining time, I want to wrap up and tell you, because this still, Still lots to do beyond that to give you an idea of what what is. So, any questions for this? Which two? Maybe because no, no, this is really good. Yeah, yeah. So, what in n dimensions? Instead of get you get a two n dimension, yeah. so, and then you still only take pairs and, and average. This plus remains key. And that, that's key. So, stop there. I'll tell you a few words uh, on what's left. Okay, so I showed you what I most of what I want to show you. I just want to don't don't be too, don't be afraid. Let me just say a few things just to get an idea of what's missing. What we did so far is basically this. I showed you how to take samples from DLS and and output samples from this. Well, I almost showed you. One thing I didn't tell you, I should tell you, is how to get the proper mixing weight. Just, just give you an idea of how this is done. Notice, in the input we have, there were maybe two thirds even, one third odd. In the output, we want maybe eighty percent even and twenty percent odd. And how do you achieve that? Well, there are standard methods of achieving that. We use something called injection sampling. I'll just give you the idea of how this is done. It's nothing. This is not, not very deep, but something that's worth knowing here. You see it before. So the input we have the two thirds come from even, one third comes from odd. We actually want to be different. We want 80% from here, 20% from here. So what we can do, we can each time each time we are about to output odd, we say, oh hang on a minute, toss a coin, toss a fair coin. And we probability half ignore that odd pair, probability half keep it. So basically, I effectively have the odd guys. Only half of the odd guys will actually be. So previously, I, uh, I output two thirds even, one third odd. Now only half of the odd will actually be output. Effectively, what I did here is I gave two thirds output even, one sixth output odd. The remaining of half. So if I normalize, you see that now this guy is four times as likely as this guy. In other words, I create 80% even, 20% off. And all I had to do is toss half of the odd guy. This is called detection sampling, standard method. I won't, uh, I won't uh, talk. I won't say much about this. Let me just say that the only non-trivial thing when you do this. Uh, is estimating those two thirds and one third because we actually don't know them. We can observe some approximation of them, but we actually don't know the numbers. 
So you, know, uh, you have to observe them somehow from the input, trying to guess how much, you know, what's the probability of each of the buckets. Um, and there are good ways of doing it and bad ways of doing it. The bad way of doing it would be you know, to take some big number of samples and see how, what fraction falls in each bucket. This would be the naive way of doing it. Um, the, bad, the, the bad thing about this is the introduce, this introduces dependencies between the various counts of buckets, and then it's a huge mess. So you can do this, but then you never finish writing a paper. A much better trick, if you, if you don't know, if you're not familiar with this, is called the Poisson trick. And the Poisson trick says that you should not fix the number of samples with respect to Poisson number of samples. Let me just demonstrate what, why this is so useful. Imagine you take a coin, and you toss the coin 100 times. And you count number of heads, number of tails. Those two numbers are not independent. If you can imagine, number of heads is 60, number of tails is 40. Okay? That could be so close. And that's bad, because if I wanted to have an independent estimates of two things, number of heads, number of tails, it would be nice if they were independent and not always some 200. So what you do instead, this is called the Poisson trick, instead of tossing the coin exactly 100 times, toss the Poisson 100 times. It's roughly 100, but it's not exactly 100. And then it just turns out that the number of heads, number of tails, are now independent from each other. So this is kind of properties of Poisson. If you know how it describes radioactive decay, you might be able to see why this is the case, but it's also very easy to write the math, and it's a standard exercise in probability. I won't do it here, but this is just very useful. Gives you independent estimates on the uh, weight of all the buckets. So, what is left? So, we know, I, I told you how to do this. The only thing I, uh, I didn't tell you, and you should be worried about now, is that in this process of rejection sampling, when we went from the probability uh, P, even P odd, we went to the square. This process necessarily loses samples. You notice here I had to toss half of the odd. So this, this loss might become much more serious, right? I had to uh, change the mixing weight among my buckets. The buckets naturally come with some weight. This is two thirds, this is one third, and this is the end of them. And I had to change the weight. I had to, some of them attenuate, some of them you know, toss away some of the others because they were too strong. The trouble with this, this will create a huge loss in the number of output samples. If you write it down carefully, you can find that the worst case loss in this process is 2 to the n over 2. And you know, once we got to this point, we thought that this is, this is, this is over. There's no way this could ever work. Because 2 to the n over 2 is the loss in one step of this uh, shrinking process. And now we don't need to repeat this n times, or the square root n times. This would be horrible. We lose a huge number of points. And we can never hope to get a two to the n, a two to the n running time. So this is something I will not be able to tell you more about. But there is this uh, amazing magic that happens and that we don't have a good intuitive understanding for. It's easy to write the algebra that I don't have a good intuitive understanding for. That even though it is possible to come up with examples where in one step of this process it would lose two to the n over two. If you consider the total loss, if you go from the beginning to the end, you multiply all those losses, the total loss of the whole process is at most 2 to the end. So one of them might be 2 to the end of 2, but if this is the case, all the others will be. Why? For different guys. So, so, it's, it's, so we're doing it from S, we're going to S over square root 2, then we're going to S over 2, and so on, S over 2 square root 2. One of those errors might lose a huge fraction of our point, 2 to the n over 2. So we started from here, 2 to the n, that's our initial pool of points. One of those errors might lose 2 to the n over 2. If this, if this happened more than twice, it would be good. Somehow, this only happens once. Only once we can lose 2 to the n over 2. It's, uh, so in other words, uh, more precisely, the product of all those losses here, 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 and so on, is at most 2 to the n over 2. I have no idea why. It's a one-line calculation. And I understand you know, send the calculation. Some, some magic things cancel. I don't have intuitive understanding why. So this is, this is a wonderful question here. So let me so just summarize. Because this is the case, and because we start from 2 to the n points, and we lose total, in total we lose only factor 2 to the n over 2, at the end of this whole process, 
we end up with 2 to the n over 2 points as I promised. And this is our final one. 2 to the n over 2 samples from the end, as I promised. And then you use the position 1 to solve for the vector at Yes. Yeah. It actually turns out that you don't need two points in each bucket. It's perfectly fine if some buckets are empty. Well, if the distribution is... Right, so what happens in this case is that the buckets like more than see some buckets are heavier than others, and they will find pairs. So are you worried about the additive loss? There's an additive loss. Each bucket can lose one. Yeah. Right. Right. And then after the whole of the step, there's still what I would describe as an additive loss. Each bucket might have a lonely element stuck there. And that element... What actually happens after the border step usually yeah, would be supported far less. It has to be actually one. At that point, yeah, at that point, the mass would be only one. But yeah, this is a concern. Ooh, the state is even bucket, but just the distribution will be different. The analysis was simplified. I only consider here the first approximation of the two of the frequency of the analytic term is worried about potentially one item left. So this is yeah, for this also the additive term. I didn't want to do it here. I mean I have enough trouble understanding why this works, which is but this is not difficult to prove. You can write down the C one. I'm suspecting there is a deeper reason why. I mean, we tried to play a whole summer to see with intuitive reason, a good explanation of what's really going on. Something is going on for sure. Sometimes it's not immediately obvious. So let me just summarize, I'll just give you, uh, so first, I think the main open question I mentioned before is how to use more structure. I mean, if you want to speed such algorithms, can you use, if it's an you know, ID lattice is coming from your favorite lattice, can you speed such algorithms somehow? Um, I should say, uh, uh, this algorithm currently runs in time 2 to the n. I mentioned that we have something that's slightly weaker, but running in time 2 to the n over 2. Let me just tell you where, where it might not be tight. And this is the set here. We went from s to s over square root 2, but actually this was more than we needed. We would be equally happy if, we, if you know, instead of square root 2, you'd have 1.01. 1 .01. And this was maybe too big a jump. It turns out that if you if you allow more uh, gradual, uh, slower jumps, then you can save a bit. Um, namely, you have to work with different power of lattices, not with, not with this uh, power, but I won't go into this. But this can bring you down to something close to the end over two. It solves a slightly different problem. It only finds vectors above the smoothing parameter, something closer to S I V P, not S I V P, if you remember from Daniel's talk. Uh, but I, I suspect that 2 to the n over 2 might be the right answer. We just don't know how to do it yet. So I still suspect maybe there is a way to do it. Maybe once we understand what's really going on, what's really going on here, we might see that how to do 2 to the n over 2. I need you help here. This is currently still a bit mysterious. So uh, more recent work, my co-authors extended this to uh, CVP, to the closest vector problem, um, which was surprisingly non-trivial. Uh, Use a similar idea. Please use this bucketing idea. It required this uh, different analysis, um, slightly different algorithm. Uh, so let me, uh, yeah, actually works. Even if we could implement it in very small dimension because of the space requirement, but you're right. 
Yeah. 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 I prefer to verify my proof than write the program and verify it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I have some vague intuitive. Yeah. So it happens roughly. So if it's like a random lattice, as you go from smoothing to very non smooth, that this will happen here. That's the threshold. That's this change between smoothing and non smoothing. That's what it's going to Yes. Yeah, I mean, it would happen in the random lattice, maybe also in something like the ZN, like happening in both cases. Okay, so let me just end with the positive, just because I always do that. It's related to what we do in what we have to use in the 2 to the n over 2 algorithm. So here's a nice puzzle. Um, we didn't invent this. This, is, uh, this would be known for some time, but let's see if, if we can solve it. So imagine I give you a coin. So I give you a coin with probability uh, p of uh, head. And you don't know p. There's some probability of head, and you don't know p. This is, let's start with the more classical stuff. I want you to produce, manufacture a coin with probability p squared of being head. So you start with a coin probability p of head. I want you to produce a coin with probability p squared of being head. This is easy. How do you do it? Posit wise, if twice it came up heads, you say heads, otherwise you say heads. So this gives you p squared, probability of both being head is p squared. Okay, this is easy. Uh, another uh, question, how do you get a coin that's unbiased? A coin probability exactly one half of the heads. If you haven't seen it, this is a classical result of uh, von Neumann. Uh, he was you know, wondering how to get unbiased randomness, how to get perfect randomness uh, given this implementation of randomness at the time. So this is, is, it, is it a nice exercise also if you don't know how to get one half. You don't immediately see this setting. No, it's a nice trick. It's called the von Neumann idea. Uh, but what I need, what we need for the student the number two, uh, and luckily this is possible, you know the first to realize this, we need a square root. So uh, you get a coin probability p, and you want a coin probability squared p. Uh, so try to think how this, how you can do this, this is a question for you. Possible. Yeah, half the time. It's like in mid air, you catch it in mid air. And, uh, <laughs> try it. Thanks, let's go. This is assuming that, uh, okay, so you're assuming here that the distribution over buckets be uniform. Right. And so what saves this is that the minute you get so few balls, also the distribution is going to become more concentrated. It will no longer be uniform over all two to the n buckets. Rather, it will concentrate on a small number of buckets. The smaller number of uh, samples is going to now concentrate on a small number of buckets. So in this, yeah, in this case, be, there are two to the n buckets in general. So maybe it should just go to the n dimensional case. Uh, and the distribution will become strongly biased. So a small number of buckets will get most of your samples. So there will be lots of collisions there. Which is nice. I wish I had some intuition.
It's not so many. So you really want to ask important things. If, if p is uh, not too close to forget is a zero one, then it's constant. Okay. So it's not okay. One thing you can always do is just toss it many many times and get some kind of rough estimate for p. That's not what you do because this, this is not the size. This will not give you the accurate uh, output. There's, there's something more elegant, slightly more elegant. Okay. 